Today, good morning, everybody. Today is eighty fourth episode of Tech Forum, and topic is material for battery. With the increase in automotive market, electric vehicle market, the need for high efficient battery have started growing up, and lot of R and D houses across the globe are working very seriously on development of a cost effective, long life battery. and now most popular battery as of today is lithium ion battery and fortunately in jammu and kashmir we have found some lithium stocks so hopefully that stock will be useful saksham is just 22 years old young graduate and will be pursuing his further education in uh, usa he has done uh, from manipal institute of technology bachelor of technology chemical engineering and later he worked on different projects uh, first with mercedes benz a uh, project was parameter estimation of high fidelity electrochemical model of lithium ion cell he also worked in institute for applied materials electrochemical technology at karlsruhe institute of technology in germany karlsruhe you may be knowing is a house for the bosch and he has worked with a very prestigious institute on battery material so we have such a great scholar scientist with us today and he'll be sharing with us his uh, present knowledge about the battery battery technology what is going to be the future because i'm sure uh, with lot of r and d houses efforts some new technology may come up and lithium ion technology may go back we have already lithium polymer has taken place in many applications so let's hear from saksham about uh, the Battery technologies. Little about Tech Forum. Tech Forum is a group of like-minded uh, technocrats. We have about hundred, hundred and fifty members who contribute towards the presentations. Also share knowledge, support each other. There are SMEs, then uh, students, faculties, academicians, and lot of technology interested people who are our members. It's a big cross section what we have. We have successfully conducted three. electric vehicle symposiums in the last 2 years and they have been welcome many in engineering colleges just to give awareness about the electrical vehicle and its technology so without spending much time i request saksham to start his presentation over to you saksham all are requested to mute their microphones as well as yeah th thank you uh, mr abre i will just share my screen please let me know if i am audible as well as my screen is visible you are audible and screen is visible go ahead no interruptions okay thank you uh so the topic for today's presentation is uh, materials for batteries past present and future uh as rabri uncle gave a very nice overview of uh, my progress in life so far i would uh, still like to take you on a journey of how i personally got into this domain of battery materials and battery technology especially as a chemical engineer um during my first year in my university manipal institute of technology we had classes online and i was very much determined to work on something hands on and i was looking for certain student projects and i knew that the ev market is something which is going to boom soon and as a chemical engineer my contribution in the domain of batteries is something that i really wanted to focus on and that's why i joined a student project called motor manipal which works on manufacturing electric super bikes and in that particular student project i was working on various types of battery chemistries that we can use for our particular particular vehicle and from there i was able to grab certain internships like uh, like uh, mr abre told i was a research intern with karlsruhe institute of technology institute of applied materials electrochemical technologies two times once in the summer of 2022 and the next time was in the summer of 2023 which is last year and during both the times i worked on two different practical projects and it gave me a lot of uh, a scope about about what the domain of battery technology and battery materials can offer I was also successful in grabbing two internships in the industry. Uh, I worked with Mercedes Benz uh, Research and Development India in Bangalore uh, in the winter of twenty twenty two, 
And over there, I was working on DFT modeling and uh, modeling using molecular dynamics for battery chemistries. And during the recent internship, which I just completed three weeks ago, it was a six month long internship where I was working on uh, developing electrochemical models of batteries, of lithium and batteries. So these, these couple of internships and my project experiences have given me a vertical overview of how the domain of batteries actually works. And that is the point of today's presentation where I can uh, share this knowledge with everyone present over here. So the, the table of contents or the topics that we're going to cover are divided into four chapters today. We have introduction to battery technology where we talk about various kinds of battery materials that are currently there in the present that have been there in the past and that might come up in the future. Uh, we'll slightly uh, go deeper in terms of uh, concepts to electrode materials where we talk about the blended electrodes and its impact on performance of batteries. And once uh, the conceptual parts are clear, uh, we I will I would li like to share a couple of experiences that I have uh, gotten during my internships with both Karlsruhe as well as Mercedes in the past one year. So it's both an overview of how battery materials uh, have progressed and also how different experiments or different simulations are there in, are currently present that helps us understand the performance of uh, these battery materials. So I'll start off with the introduction. When we talk about energy storage and especially when we talk about batteries, we have two different uh, classifications. We have the primary cell and we have the secondary cell. So the primary cell is usually uh, the, the normal alkaline batteries that we use in our TV remotes or maybe in our AC remotes, in our watches. Um, and the second is the secondary cells, which are rechargeable technology. So once they are discharged, you can again charge them up and uh, use them from 100% uh, capacity. These are batteries which are usually used in our mobile phones or laptops or anything which requires constant uh, charging and discharging. A very prominent form of this particular cell is the lithium ion battery, which is currently used everywhere. Like I said, laptops, mobiles, smartwatches, electric vehicles, and a lot of research and development since the past uh, 40, 50 years have been in the secondary cells because of, uh, uh, of the nature of ch constant charging and discharging. Uh, when we talk about a battery, there are technically four main components of a battery. We have the two current collectors, the positive current collector and the negative current collector. We have the two electrodes and then we have a separator and electrolyte. So four components, which are usually a sandwich layer, as you can see in the figure uh, over here. Let me just check if I can uh, come up with a laser pointer. Yeah. So as you can uh, see over here, this is typically a jelly roll, which is a sandwich of these four components. And when we look at batteries that are cylindrical in nature or prismatic in nature, then uh, we usually have these jelly rolls which are present inside the battery and they are a sandwich layer of these four components. And we will be getting back to this diagram when we talk about electrochemical models in the further slides. Uh, the working principle of any sort of uh, battery is the conversion of chemical energy into electrical energy be it a primary cell or a secondary cell, there is a chemical reaction that, that takes place inside the battery and the flow of electrons help in, uh, the, con uh, help in the conversion uh, to the electrical energy. When we uh, specifically talk about the lithium ion uh, chemistry, as we know that it's a rechargeable form of chemistry, we have the working principle based on the charging and discharging of um, uh, of the battery, which is basically the constant intercalation and deintercalation of lithium ions from one electrode to the other electrode. And uh, uh, th this helps in the process of charge transfer and thus the conversion of chemical en energy from the reaction to the electrical energy that we get as an output. Once, uh, uh, yeah, so I'll be moving on to the next slide where uh, we talk about the timeline of battery technology. So the graph over here, this represents the rechargeable battery technology. As we discussed, the non-rechargeable battery technology was developed way early during the 18, eight, early 1800s. And uh, since then, not a lot of development is focused on the uh, non-rechargeable battery technology because of the pros of the rechargeable technology. The One of the earliest uh, 
rechargeable battery technologies or the secondary cells were the lead acid uh, uh, cells and this these are probably the most prominent cells if you look at uh, how they have evolved over time because still in our ic vehicles uh, that that we drive we still have the lead acid lead acid battery as the small battery unit in our uh, ic vehicles which power the maybe the horn or the indicator lights etc uh, throughout the timeline, we went from lead acid to nickel iron to nickel cadmium to nickel metal hydride and then to lithium ion. Uh, while all of these showed prominent progress having some sort of pros and some sort of cons, the only constant uh, uh, battery technology that has been present throughout the, probably the last four or five decades has been the lithium ion battery technology. It was developed early in the in, in the late 1980s around 1986 by sony and it had a chemistry of a graphite anode and an lco cathode now lco is lithium cobalt oxide and this was the very first lithium ion battery technology that was developed of course it had its pros it had its cons and that's the reason the battery materials have also progressed throughout the 1986 1980s to currently in the 20 uh, 20s Again, that is something we will cover in the upcoming slides. Uh, presently, if you see, a lot of research and development has shifted towards uh, sodium ion battery, which again in academia was uh, uh, have, academia was doing research on it probably uh, 10, 12 years ago. And recently, there are certain companies, some in fact, in-house academic institutions have come up with some uh, sodium ion uh, battery startups, which are even prominent in India. So what we do know that uh, whatever happens in the academia may come into the industry probably 10 to 12 years later. This is what we have seen with lithium ion. This is also what we have seen with sodium ion. Apart from the sodium ion battery technology, if we focus on lithium, we still have lithium air and lithium sulfur batteries, which are still in the research and development phase. And the most exciting and the most promising technology that is probably going to take over in the next 12 to 15 years is going to be the solid state batteries uh, because of the kind of performance that we expect from those batteries, be it in terms of uh, the safety, be it in terms of lifespan. Uh, there is a tendency for solid state batteries to probably be very promising uh, in the upcoming 12 to 15 years. Another uh, important technology that uh, is being currently focused on, or maybe since the past 10 years, has been the blended electrodes. So by, like, like I said, we have just a graphite anode. There are uh, certain battery manufacturers which have experimented with other fabrications, and uh, they have doped a little bit of silicon with graphite, or maybe in the cathode side, they are mixing two different kinds of uh, lithium ion chemistries for cathode, and seeing how the performance of these batteries, they, they change. So we will be talking about the blended electrodes as well in the upcoming slides. This was just to give you an overview of how the battery technology has evolved with uh, time. Uh, moving on, uh, in the introduction part, I talk about other topics, which is availability and cost analysis, as well as uh, how is lithium actually converted from uh, land to, to the battery. So the next two slides will be focused on these two uh, topics. When it comes to uh, lithium reserves, there is something known as the lithium triangle, which is present in the southern uh, American continent. And it's uh, there are three particular countries which have almost 80% uh, of the, no, no, not, not, sorry, not the 80%, but around 40% of the deposits of uh, lithium. And these are Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Apart from this, we have two other major countries, which are US and Australia, which also have a good amount of lithium ion uh, reserves. And they do uh, have certain companies which are coming up in the US and, and, and in the Australia, which are uh, using these lithium ion uh, reserves to make good lithium ion technology. However, when it comes to the Southern American continent, this is majorly controlled by China. 
and china although it has just around 7 to 10% of uh, world's lithium reserves they do an import of approximately 70% and also use the same amount of lithium for their batteries and especially batteries for their own countries out of the top 10 uh, most prominent uh, lithium ion manufacturers six are basically from china and the top most is catl or cattle a lot of uh, automobile industries use the cattle cells because they provide the right amount of energy density and power density that is required for electric vehicle usage. If we just look at uh, the breakdown of uh, the cost of in order to make a particular battery, uh, it, it's very interesting because this cost, it actually varies when the material, material is in the R&D phase. And once the fabrication and all is done, if we are going to commercialize it, the cost is going to reduce. So if we just look at the raw material cost, it's probably around 60 to 65% of the cost of each battery. However, the cathode takes the majority cost. Some, some uh, data say that it's 20%, some say it's around 30%. However, it's the cathode, which, cathode material which takes the most amount of uh, cost which requires to take the, make the battery. And this is one another reason why a lot of research and development is focused on the cathode material side rather than the anode material side. And apart from the other the, the 60 65 percent, the rest of it goes into the labor, goes into the utilities and maybe the indirect cost, uh, selling it, some commissions, etc. The other important point over here is the other materials that you can see, which contributes to probably around five to seven percent of the uh, cost of making a battery. And uh, these are basically uh, binders and additives that are added with the electrode material. So these these two three uh, different uh, materials are mixed with the electrode so that they can provide better binding. Uh, a, a better performance out of the electrode. The electrode might get more stable if you're adding additives, if you're adding the binder. And with this, uh, we will move to the next slide on extraction of uh, lithium. So lithium in the world is probably in uh, is found in two different types. One is the lithium brines and the other is the lithium deposits, mineral deposits. So there are two ways in which uh, uh, lithium is found. M more or less, uh, it's the mineral deposits which uh, are comparatively lesser compared to the brine deposits. And the extraction of lithium from both these deposits are is done in two different ways. When it comes to the lithium brine, this is uh, this is very prominent in the lithium uh, triangle that that we talked about. Uh, in the previous slide of countries between Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. And these, these lithium brines are uh, first pumped into something known as evaporation ponds, where uh, it's, it's evaporated and then the, the salts or the, the precipitation is uh, kept as the water has been evaporated, the liquid has been evaporated. And once we have these salts with, uh, with us, we are going to make a mother liquor out of it and extract the lithium rich solution and purify it. So this is a comparatively easier and a less um, financial uh, process, uh, less financially loaded process to extract lithium. The other method, which is very prominent, especially in Asia or Northern America, is extracting lithium from the mineral. And this is like any... Um, a particular mining process where because we have a mineral we are going to mine that particular area we are going to crush it we are going to make a concentration out of it we are going to leach it and then we are going to uh, extract uh, the purified material from the mineral so any uh, metallurgical process is usually uh, used in order to uh, extract lithium out of uh, mineral uh, one more thing that is not very much seen in this particular map is the European subcontinent. Uh, when, when we look at Germany, because uh, when I was working in Germany, I also got to know that there is a Rhine Valley, which, uh, which is present in the southern half of Germany. Even over there, they have recently found uh, certain deposits of 
uh, lithium brine. And there are certain companies which are coming up with new technologies in order to extract material from these uh, brine deposits. Fortunately, even in India, uh, I think probably six months or uh, 12 months ago, we came to know that there is a good amount of uh, lithium reserve that we found on the LOC between the POK and the Azad Kashmir, the Riyasi region. And uh, this is one another reason why the certain Indian companies, which are which will now probably focus on developing in-house lithium ion battery battery technology. We do have Indian companies which are doing the same. However, the lithium that is required for the raw material is being uh, imported from other countries. Uh, however, with the current uh, uh, scenario, maybe we have uh, an increase in the in-house uh, lithium ion technology uh, startups in India. Okay, so uh, this next uh, particular topic is about the cathochemistries mm -hmm. and the KPIs, key performance indicators. Uh, two slides back, I did mention about the cost analysis, and I and I and you saw that good amount of uh, financial load is being uh, taken for the uh, cathode material that is being. Uh, used in the batteries. And that is the reason why from 1986, since the first, since the introduction of the LCO cell, we have seen an uprise in the research and development and uh, in the research and development of cathode chemistries. And in 2020, there are six particular cathode chem chemistries which are uh, used, which are properly validated and are uh, used for various other applications. So these six particular chemistries are NMC, which is the lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, the NCA, lithium nickel cobalt aluminum oxide, LFP, lithium iron phosphate, LCO, lithium cobalt oxide, LMO, lithium manganese oxide, and LTO, lithium titanium oxide. So these six chemistries have various uses. They are not used for the same kind of work. As I've, as I've already worked with the EV industry, my uh, idea about the usage of NMC and LFP are more compared to the other uh, four battery chemistries. A simple layman way to understand this graph is the area that the colored region is, is covering. So more the area that the colored region covers, you could say that the performance of the battery is going to be better. So uh, we have, if you look at the graph, we can see that the NMC and the LFP covered the maximum regions. And that is the reason why these two technologies are more prominent in the EV industry. While we require a very good output from the battery, we also require it to be safe and cost effective for the electric vehicle. And that's one reason why we use these two particular chemistries. In order to understand the KPIs, uh, we have six KPIs which uh, help us analyze if this particular chemistry is going to be functional for our work. And that is specific energy, specific power, cost, safety, lifespan, and performance. I think the last four points, which are cost, safety, lifespan, and performance are pretty easy to understand. We want our batteries, to, our battery materials to be cost effective. We want our materials to be safe so that there is no uh, thermal runaway or lithium plating or any sort of uh, electrochemical reaction inside the cell, which might probably cause a fire or might cause the vehicle or the battery pack to explode. We want the batteries to have a good lifespan so that even, uh, even though we are using them on a constant basis, we don't need to change the battery pack for a long, longer period of time. When we talk about lifespan, there are two particular uh, terms that are very much, uh, very frequently used in the battery world. One is the state of health and the other is state of charge. So SOH and SOC. Uh, in order to understand SOC, it's it's simple. If you're charging a mobile phone, it's going from 0% to 100%. So state of uh, charge is basically 100% SOC is when you have total amount of your capacity completely filled in the battery and your capacity moves from 100% to 0%. The other term is state of health. Now, state of health is nothing but how much of the material that was initially present in the battery 
is still there. So what might happen is that your capacity of the battery is slowly going to fade because of constant charging and discharging. So the, the reduction in the capacity of a battery or the, of your total capacity of a battery is going to reduce from 100% to 95 to 90 to 85 to 80. And this is your SOH. So even at 80% health, you might be going from 0% charging to 100% charging. However, the capacity at 80% health is way lesser than capacity at 100% health. When it comes to using the rechargeable battery technology, the most uh, prominent uh, parameter of uh, reduction in capacity should be taken from 100% SOH to 80% SOH. Post the reduction from 80% SOH, the battery is considered to be useless and is usually uh, discarded. Then we have the performance. The performance is technically measured in uh, a, a lot of ways. We have what's the voltage uh, levels that it hits. So a, a typical NMC or an NCA cell will discharge from 4.2 volts to 2.5 volts. Whereas in case of an LFP, the top cap of voltage might be somewhere around 3.7 volts. So this is one way in which we can understand the performance of a cell. In order to, to and we'll be talking about the specific energy and specific power of the cells in the upcoming slides. Yeah. So specific energy and specific power. In order to, while you, while you go through the content of the slide, I will like to provide a very simple example which can uh, help us imagine what specific energy and specific power is. So what happens is if you fill a bottle of water, for example, I have a bottle of water here. If I fill the bottle of water and I just keep it at an inclination where the water is not falling as of now, whatever amount of water that this particular bottle has can be that it can store, the capacity of water it can store can be termed as specific energy. However, how quickly can this bottle of water actually pro, uh, provide the flow of water into a glass? Is, is can be considered as the specific power. So just change the uh, imagination of this bottle with a battery. What is the capacity that this uh, battery can store? Get, can be related to the specific energy of the cell. And how quickly can this battery provide a high amount of power as an output is what we can say to be the specific power. The difference between specific power and specific energy when it comes to units is just uh, the watt R versus watt in the numerator. And this is one particular reason why uh, certain batteries might show more amount of specific energy, whereas the others might show slightly more uh, specific power. If you look at the left-hand side of this particular slide, we have this graph which compares the specific power of a cell with the specific energy of a cell. And this is these are more or less all the energy storage devices that we have as of now, including subcaps. We have lead acid batteries, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, uh, lithium polymer, as well as lithium ion. And you can see uh, that the maximum amount of uh, specific uh, power as well as specific energy is found for the lithium ion battery technology. Now, some chemistries might show very high power, some might show high power, whereas the other chemistries might show high energy. So depending on the application, we end up using the kind of uh, lithium ion chemistry that is desired. So while some electric vehicle uh, companies focus on high uh, output of power, there are some which might focus on a longer range. And based on th these particular pros and cons, we are going, they, they end up deciding what kind of chemistry is required. So a, a high specific energy can provide a higher range because it has more capacity. Whereas a specific, uh, high specific power batteries, uh, they will provide, they can, you can discharge the battery to higher C rates and without impacting its lifespan for a good amount of time. And uh, th that is the gamble that uh, companies end up taking. Now, what happened was we have various batteries having various chemistries having various pros and various cons. And then scientists and researchers thought, why not mix these chemistries together? You get advantages of both the chemistries that we uh, desire. However, the drawback of blending these electrodes is that you're also going to get the disadvantages of both these chemistries together. 
in this particular slide, we are going to discuss on the blended electrodes, especially in the anode. In the, in the past 12 years, we have seen researchers working on doping silicon oxide in the graphite anodes. And this has its pros. Definitely, it has its pros. However, it also has uh, disadvantages, which now the current R&D is trying to tackle. While doping silicon in graphite, has it has been observed that it increases the energy density of the battery by quite a bit. The drawback is that it swells the battery quicker. So the retention of capacity fades very quickly. If you uh, look at this particular graph uh, on the uh, bottom left of my screen, you can see there are four different discharges. Uh, the graph is between the capacity retention and the number of cycles. And these are for, for four different materials. You have just a plain graphite anode. You have a graphite anode with silicon, 15% uh, silicon doped. You have a graphite anode with 25% silicon doped and 50% silicon doped. And you can see as you're increasing the silicon doping, you are uh, you end up aging the cell quicker compared to a cell which does not have any doped uh, uh, silicon. It has, it has plain graphite. And within 700 cycles, you can see a drop of capacity by around 25%. Whereas this is somewhere still close to 95%. This is dropped to almost 70%. So this is a very big drawback, and this is one thing that the you know, that the R and D industry at the moment is trying to work towards. The other drawback, apart from the capacity retention, is the swelling of the cell. So what happens is, if you look at this particular figure, it gives a very good imagination of what happens inside the uh, inside the cell if you if you're doping silicon. So after you charge. The silicon, it, silicon oxide, it has a tendency to expand. And that's why the electrode material, it ends up swelling a little bit. And this swelling, it is, it is, it is of two types. It can either be reversible or ir irreversible based on the type of losses that the electrode encounters. The, that depth is not what we are going to go towards in this particular talk. However, this is definitely a huge drawback. And if this is an irreversible swelling, then the cell is going to swell up very quickly. And as the cells are arranged together in order to make a battery pack, this impact of pressure on the cell is going to uh, increase the pressure on the cell, which is right next to it. And this cell will also swell, which will create an impact right next to the cell, which is beside it. So a lot of swelling will provide force on the battery pack, which is already in a constrained environment. And this logic was the, uh, the topic behind my research work with Karlsruhe. And it, it, this is called electrochemical mechanical coupling of lithium ion batteries. So although the topic might be a little bit tricky to, uh, uh, to understand, but it's, it's simple. The impact of pressure on the electrochemical nature of lithium ion batteries was what I worked on during my three months with KIT. Of course, we did not use the graphite and silicon uh, based anode, but we did use a blended electrode for the cathode side, which again has a, has a similar kind of an issue where you might end up swelling the material, swelling the electrodes because the, the, the electrode is not a homogeneous material anymore. It is having two different materials, having two different properties. <clears throat> So this was a <clears throat> test setup which was developed uh, by my supervisors in KIT. And that's why it's more in German. So, but to explain it simply, we had three particular uh, sensors with one uh, base plate over which there was a holder in which we arranged our particular cell. And then using springs, we added load on the cell and took it up to various uh, uh, megapascals. And we tried to, <clears throat> we, we tried to analyze the impact of pressure on these particular cells. So it's an impact of external force, which the batteries might face. The other reason why this research was important was because back in 2019, uh, certain other researchers in Germany, they ended up finding that at a particular uh, optimal pressure, the battery ends up 
showing better uh, capacity retention. And we wanted to understand if this particular topic is true, if, if this particular research is, is actually valid for all kinds of cells that are present in the market. And if, if this was true, then leaving a little bit of space in the batteries that uh, might end up spreading would probably be more advantageous to the performance of the battery. And this was the uh, overall mindset of research that we uh, did for this particular uh, project. This again is a part of the project that we did. And this is a very commonly used technique in order to understand the performance of any, any energy storage system. And it's called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So you have these EIS instruments where you uh, keep your cells and uh, you are going to perform th this kind of spectroscopy where uh, waves of different frequencies have, are, uh, uh, you know what, they, they are uh, kept on the particular cell. And then we uh, see the performance output of the, of the particular uh, cell. So a typical uh, our analysis of the EIS is done in two ways. We have the Nyquist plots and we have the DRT plots or the distribution of relaxed time plots. The output of these particular plots are going to be uh, curves with peaks and lows. And each peak and each low does contribute to a different electrochemical phenomena that is taking place inside the battery. So uh, if, if you can see a Nyquist plot, which has two very prominent peaks and then a, a slight linear, a more or less linear kind of an increase in element. This particular element accounts for the diffusion. The biggest peak is usually for the charge transfer. We have ionic and electrical resist resistance as the initial part of the peak. And then we have a small peak which might contribute to the contact resistance. And this is one way in which you can analyze the output of spectroscopy. And similarly, same type of uh, different phenomena can be used to analyze the output in terms of the DRT plots, same electrochemical uh, phenomena, and uh, but, but a different uh, plot because this is between frequency and a, uh, and a, and a uh, ohm second function. So this is a, a way in which you understand the performance of batteries. And uh, the other, the next step to uh, after performing the EIS is to usually make uh, equivalent circuit models, which are made with various ele electrical elements such as resistances, uh, uh, inductors, capacitors. You have a constant phase element, and you you try to arrange them in uh, in in different forms in order to see if your uh, equivalent circuit model fits the uh, Nyquist plot. If, if we go to any R&D industry, uh, we, will, uh, we will understand that all our uh, circuit models that, that uh, the teams analyze, simulation teams analyze, are actually based on the ECM models that they have developed by, by testing uh, batteries on the EIS multiple times. And uh, moving on, uh, so I'm I'm coming towards the end of my presentation where I have the final two slides, uh, which provide a slight insight of the work that I that I did with Mercedes Benz. So while the work with Germany was more or less very practical in nature, we I I had a I had an exposure to simulation based models with Mercedes Benz, where I worked on uh, developing electrochemical models like I had mentioned previously. So electrochemical models and equivalent circuit models that we discussed in the previous slides are two different ways in order to understand the performance of batteries. While ECM models are based on practical experiments, the electrochemical models, they are either, uh, they, they, they are made on uh, simulation. So we have three particular uh, electrochemical models which are very prevalent in the industry. And again, I use for three different purposes based on the complexity and accuracy that they have. We have the single uh, particle model. We have the single particle model with electrolyte. And then we have the pseudo 2D or the P2D model. So the single particle model, as the name suggests, what it does is it takes into account the electrode as a single particle. And there is no presence of electrolyte in, in the model at all. It is just the mass transfer that is taking place between the two uh, electrode materials. And as it assumes uniform concentration, and potential within the electrode, the accuracy of the model is slightly lower, as well as the complexity is low. So it, it's, it's a very quick simulation that takes place. 
building onto the SPM, we have something known as the SPM electrolyte or the SPME model, which of course takes again single particles in the electrode as well as electrolyte that is that is present. And so we have the charge transfer or the ionic transfer as well as the mass transfer that is taking place. So two types of diffusions that are taking place, but uh, it is only in the, uh, what do you say? It is only in the actual direction and there is no spatial variation in the particular model. And finally, we have the third uh, model, which is the most prevalent in the industry. Almost all battery manufacturers or automobile uh, de design companies, they end up using the P2D model in order to run the simulations. Um, this is also referred to as the DFN or the doiler fueler human model or the zero two dimensional model. And it takes into account both charge transfer and mass transfer, but it has a uh, spatial variation inside the electrode. And that's why it's the most uh, advanced model. It's the most accurate model, as well as its complexity is, is, uh, is way better compared to the SPM and SPM model. It takes some time to run the simulation. However, if you, if you want to analyze the swelling that takes place inside the battery or how the battery is going to age, the best model in order to understand that is the P2D model. And this helps us understand the aging of the battery without, in fact, even performing uh, experimental tests. So if we have a very accurate model, we can predict the aging of the battery using this and then validate also using the uh, experimental tests. Uh, moving on to the final slide, I would like to talk a little bit more on the P2D model and how it is uh, developed. So there are technically five equations which govern the working of this model. And those are two equations for the uh, fixed law. And we have the potential distribution in the solid electrode phase as well as the electrolyte phase. And the final equation that we have is for the mass transfer, uh, sorry, it's, it's for the kinetics of um, the lithium intercalation and deintercalation that takes place inside the uh, electrode, uh, which is followed by the butler volmer equation. So the whole model is just based on these five equations, but it has probably around 20 to 25 parameters that are required in order to develop this model initially. And that was my the focus of my work in uh, Mercedes-Benz R&D India. And I think with this, I would like to complete my uh, talk for today. I hope I have shared the knowledge that I have gained throughout these uh, four years of my undergraduate studies across my all my internships with uh, everyone today and yeah thank you thank you saksham for this wonderful coverage you have really taken us to the research work that you have done and also very well covered uh, the various battery technologies and materials needed uh, friends saksham has signed nda with german uh, karlsru germany as well as mercedes so any question crossing the limit he may not be able to answer but we will keep the now session open for question and answer. Please identify your name and ask questions. Fire. Okay, I will start. I am, my yeah. name is Makaran Vaidya. Uh, Saksham, yeah, I... uh, you have shown the EIS of charge cycle. But yeah. similar must be for the discharge cycle also, no? Uh, yes, 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 definitely. So this is for the charge cycle. And I only had pictures because these pictures were developed by KIT. So I've also given their uh, uh, citation over there, the picture. So I just wanted to give an insight on, okay, are we doing okay. yes, and this is how various elements can be represented on the various curves, peaks of right. the, this plot. Right. So second question was actually, you're not uh, uh, mentioned anything about the temperature change while charging and discharging. Uh, because of the yes. electrochemical reaction. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, uh, while the battery is charged as well as discharged, so there are different algorithms, in fact, that we use, especially for charging. There is something known as the CCCV charging that we use, that is constant current, constant voltage. So, this is these algorithms are also done so as to maintain the temperature of the battery. A typical lithium-ion battery should always be, uh, have a temperature which is in the range of minus 10 degrees to somewhere around 50 degrees because lesser than that temperature might cause lithium plating, which is again an, uh, a, a phenomenon which might reduce the capacity. And having a temperature which is above 50 degrees might lead to something known as the thermal runaway, which might lead to a blast of the cell. 
So the temperature in which we need to operate a lithium ion battery is between minus 10 degrees to 50 degrees. When we are, especially when we are discharging, in fact, uh, we require, we, we end up discharging it at higher C rates as well. So there are batteries which the manufacturers say can go up to 6C. And uh, that is something that might increase the temperature of the battery. But in this generation, we have something known as a BMS, which helps controlling and monitoring the temperature of the cells as well. So uh, that is something that I thought uh, is also an influence of BMS that is there in the battery packs that uh, EVs have, or maybe even other electronic components have. So, yeah. So it's okay. actually a... So it's actually a charging and discharging temperature. Instead, it is the ambient temperatures also. Minus 10 and plus 50 might be the ambient conditions. It's ambient temperature, yes. It's the, it's the temperature around the uh, cell. So they are happening beyond 50 and below 10. Yeah, yeah, definitely. See, ambient temperature might increase because, of course, you, have, you don't have one cell in a battery pack. You have probably, uh, if you look at any EV, there are probably around... Uh, 100 s and 2p or 100 s 4p so there are approximately 200 to 400 cells that are present in in a particular battery pack which are divided into various modules and they have a cooling mechanism also that is usually present they either ah. air cool it or water cool it so yes. that also helps in maintaining the ambient temperature of the overall yes. battery pack that is very much okay, okay thank friends, you next question we take few interesting questions now any comments also welcome? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, my name is Shardul. I am a research scholar, research scholar at Pune University. Okay. I'd like to thank Saksham for this beautiful presentation. Uh, first, uh, one thing I want to ask is the, uh, during, if you see a particular typical discharge, uh, initially, the curve is a kind of exponential and then it goes linear. So I want to know more about the processes uh, happening during discharge, like polarization and uh, diffusion and then ohmic resistance. How to understand these uh, phenomena, what factors are affecting and how to identify in particular cell. And so you're also... talking about the EIS graph, right? Uh, you're talking about this particular graph, right? Uh, yeah, this is uh, in terms of EIS. Uh, if we plot it with, uh, for a fixed DC discharge, in that uh, curve also we find that. Okay, so for example, like a voltage. But uh, in this, lined we can or... understand better. Yeah, uh, so uh, we have usually, uh, those are referred to as performance curves. So we have either voltage versus time graph or OCV versus uh, SOC graph. Uh, are you are you talking about those graphs? If I'm if I'm correct. Yes. Uh, I, actually, I'm talking about that graph, but uh, representation may be anything. I, I want to know more about these phenomena, so polarization, diffusion, and uh, what are factors affecting all these performance. Okay. So if if you uh so diffusion let let's uh, pick up the topic of diffusion. So if you uh, usually look at the voltage versus time graph, it's uh it's something like it will slowly decrease up to the, around uh, the 3.5 volt mark, and then it suddenly shoots down, shoots down to probably somewhere around 2.7 volts. Right. That's a typical yes, voltage yes. versus time graph. Uh. The influence of diffusion. So it is not easy to directly mention which electrochemical phenomena is taking place at what particular instant in that graph. There are a couple of phenomena like over potential as well, which influence how between the 4.2 uh, volts and the 3.5 volts mark, how the curve is going to behave. So if there is a particular over potential that the particular uh, electrode, the cathode or the anode is facing, there might be a, a, the slope of the graph might change between the 4.2 volts and the 3.7 volt mark. Now, if we just talk about the diffusion, uh, while making an electrochemical model, we can do a sensitivity analysis on what kind of parameter is being affected on which kind of area. So with, with my personal experience, I have observed that the diffusion of the negative electrode is more influential to uh, 
towards the later half of the curve that is after 3.5 volts when there is a sudden dip uh, there's an incremental dip in the curve between 3.5 uh, volts to 2.7 volts. The diffusion of the negative electrode uh, is more sensitive over there, whereas the diffusion in the positive electrode is more sensitive on the top part of the region. Now, this is just for a discharge curve. This is for a discharge curve. So it's more influential in the top part of the region between uh, 4.2 volts and the uh, 3.7 volts mark. So this is one particular uh, phenomena. However, directly uh, relating uh, the voltage versus time curves with the EIS graphs is, I don't think that is uh, very much possible. But if it's there, I would definitely probably read about it and get, ba get back to you. Uh, Shardul, are you working yes, on sir. the batteries in university? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm working at uh, Center for Energy Studies Department. And uh, uh, in that I'm uh, working on energy, energy storage lab, particularly lithium ion batteries and BMS. That's okay. What I'm See, Saksham is here for a week. If you wish, we can okay. organize this presentation for your group okay. uh, in Pune University. Yes, yes, yes. You, yes uh, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe after the meeting. Uh, yes, sir. I have missed, I've seen your message on the group. So maybe uh, after meeting we can communicate. Uh, you can send me. Uh, you can check up next week. He can, we can organize your his presentation with a particular topic in mind. What you thought? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So good. Shardul, thank you. Uh, next question, thank please. You. Any comment? Question? Please go ahead. Ravade sir, please allow me the third question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Saksham. Uh, hello, Saksham. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. My simple question is like a hisab or the balance balance sheet. Okay. I wish to ask you the simple question like efficiency of battery in the terms of the energy consumed while charging and energy used by the load, irrespective of the charge discharge cycles and levels. So that is the basic, uh, you can call it as a balance sheet or hisab. How much you spend in the charging and how much you are getting out at, to the load uh, discharging, irrespective of levels and irrespective of the rate of discharge and charge. So can you put a light on it? It is a simple uh, question. Uh, no, like do you want in terms of uh, which sense, like uh, performance of the battery? Yeah, because it is a it is a clear cut indication of how much I am spending and how much I am getting in return, like way. So, like in financial terms, when you're how much money you're spending on charging versus uh... same thing, it is turned into finance only after all. But it is actually a, how much you are spending on uh, consuming and how much you are getting in return. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it is a finance, but at the same time, it is also a simple uh, way of looking at the thing. Okay, so. Uh, honestly, in order to answer that, I would say if your battery is having a health between 90% to 100%, your output would probably uh, be on the positive side. But once your battery's health has reduced below, probably even below 90%, after that, the amount of uh, input that you're providing will is not going to turn out into the output. And it's not just uh, uh, maybe in terms of performance or finance, it's also mental satisfaction, especially if you have an electric vehicle. You will probably always be worried of uh, not being able to cover the distance that your car would originally be covering. So that is always there. But dropping from that 100% to 90% health and you finding your uh, output to be lesser than your input would probably take a few years. So probably uh, around three to four years be before your battery might go below the 90% SOH. Like there's this a lot of uh, conservation of energy. So always output will be always lower than the input that you have put for charging the battery. The amount of It may be amount of money. It may be amount of charge or kilowatt hours. So uh, it depends upon the which technology you are using. Yeah. So lithium ion as on today is better. But tomorrow something else may come out and give a better performance. And definitely. Yeah. I think that answers your question. Uh, any more question? And those who have joined uh, for the first time today, I request them to uh, become a member of Tech Forum. I think Anil has provided everything in the chat box. So let's go for one more question. We have some time. 
and any comment expert comments are also welcome mr vishwas kare would you like to give any comment who is not there okay anyone from this uh, branch are uh, working on battery battery material technology are most welcome to ask questions okay i think uh, he has uh, mentioned so clearly in his presentation i think most of the inputs that he has shared with all of you are quite relevant and useful for those who are studying and those who want to make it uh, they make their batteries or performance of the batteries more efficient i must thank saksham because he is still studying and he'll be doing his further graduation in us probably when he will come back to india we will organize his one more presentation so he'll be fill the rich uh, to share more and more knowledge with all of us friends next presentation we have planned on hydrogen generation uh, which will be on 21st of uh, july uh, this month i think we have covered three presentations of course saksham presentation was a special one so i must thank saksham for this nice study and sharing knowledge with all of us uh, we will always welcome you at forum whenever you will be back in india and we will we would like to have your presentation because friends we encourage youngster young scientists like saksham who really work hard study hard and try to gain knowledge and once they are rich with the knowledge they may put something in the nation's gdp definitely their research work is going to be converted into a product or services so thanks a lot saksham and with this note i say good morning to everybody have a wonderful day and see you next sunday bye bye